Part of my hope tonight is, even though it's a talk and I'm going to be doing the, the vast majority of the talking, is to give you a feeling when you leave. I, I hope part of the experience that you have tonight is feeling seen, even though I'm just going to be talking. You're not going to be sharing a lot of information. I don't come to these. I don't come to these to teach you things that you don't know. I don't teach, I don't write to teach you things that you don't know. I do this to remind you of things that you've forgotten, things you've lost. But the greatest compliment I ever received from my very first television interview on my first book was one of the hosts said, I knew all of this already. I just didn't have the words for it. And that's really what the process has been like for me in psychotherapy. Really, the, this work comes from my own psychotherapy. I, I teach this all the time to our therapists, and this is going to be the theme tonight. I teach this idea that there's no great therapist, I've never met a great therapist who doesn't do their own work. The kind of work that I do, the kind of teaching that I do, isn't based on my academic training. It's not based on my degree and the books that I've read, my professors, it's not from that place. It's from, honestly, the humble place of being the one on the other side of the couch, being the one in, in psychotherapy. Carl Jung has a, a very famous saying that he uses and he says, to understand somebody else's darkness, you need to understand your own. And I think when I, when I think about the topic tonight of raising resi resilient children, I think about that idea of knowing them because you know yourself. I, I, I tell this to the therapists I train, that the lantern that I use is fueled by my self-knowledge, by my work. And, and, and by the way, I want to be clear, that's not some high and mighty idea of who I am. The work is not realizing how great you are, how wonderful you are, how gifted and beautiful and smart and talented you are. The work is realizing your own darkness, your own, what's driving your behaviors, what's driving your reactions. So that's my goal tonight, is to give you that, that sense that you're okay. I really want you to have that, that sense that even if you have a struggling child, that you're not off track, that it's an invitation to a larger life. Those of us who have struggling children, and I've, I've had struggling children, I have a struggling child right now. Those of us who have them, we know that it, it breaks us and, and we bleed in the process, emotionally, spiritually. And I believe that their struggle doesn't happen by coincidence about the time that we're going through midlife. I believe it is, is, it's part of our wake-up call, part of our invitation to a bigger life. When I was in graduate school, I really struggled to finish my dissertation. It took me a long time after I finished my coursework. I, was, I had started my career and People were hiring me. In fact, I'd started Evoke before I finished my PhD because I just couldn't find the motivation and the structure to do it. And I had this wonderful, amazing professor who wouldn't guide me, wouldn't direct me. She just kept saying, whatever you want to do, I'm here to support you. She, wa she was treating me like I was a grown-up and I was still a child at 30 years of, of age. I ended up switching to another professor who would tell me what to do. I needed that at that point and he gave me his research. At the time, I really didn't choose the research. The, you know, he essentially gave it to me. We, we studied two things. We looked at, at young adults in college settings um, who had two kinds of trauma, very common trauma. One was divorce, and the other one was at least one parent um, by report was a problem drinker or an alcoholic. So all of, all of the young adults in the study had one of those two traumas. And what we wanted to find was, was there anything in the family that mitigated the trauma? You've heard me say this a lot if you've listened to the podcast or read the books. You cannot not dent your children. And oh, and by the way, if you happen to be here and you don't have children, just translate it to being the child. You cannot not be dented by your parents. Every parent dents their child. My mother came to me after a talk. Maybe you've heard the story. She came to me. My idiot brother invited her to a parenting talk that I was giving in Orange County, California, where I'm from. And so he thought it would be a great idea to invite our mother. Never have your mother come to a parenting talk. That's the worst idea. <laughs> Afterwards, we're sitting in the reception area. My brother and I, he's my, my closest friend. And uh, he hasn't done a lot of therapy work. Um, he just kind of gets by anxiously. My mother walks up to the two of us and she says, um, I think I should start feeling, I tried to talk fast enough, I really did. 
She's got a brain injury, and I thought if I talk fast enough, which I do anyway, I could lose her, but she grasped some of it. And she said, I, I think that I should feel badly for some of the ways I treated you boys growing up. And I said to her, I can't control how you feel. If you want to feel bad about it, that's your thing to figure out. But it could be helpful if you knew what you did wrong, if you knew the mistakes that you made. That would be really nice, especially, I thought, for my brother, who hasn't been in psychotherapy. It'd be a really great gift to give to, to him, to be able to acknowledge and name the, the ways that you hurt him. Um, and um, the, I said to her, the shame that you feel, the guilt that you feel, that, that idea that you need to feel bad about it, that actually, not only will it not help and serve us in really any real capacity, but it will block you from knowing yourself. That's really what I'm talking about all the time is the shame and the guilt of being human, being fallible, being imperfect. So back to the study. We're looking at a very common set of, of, of experiences that lots of children have, divorce and, and alcohol and, and problem drinking in the family. We're looking, at what, we're looking at what might mitigate that, what might lessen that. The outcome variable was if they re reported stable relationships in adulthood, if they had romantic relationships that they found rewarding uh, and contributing to the quality of their life. There were a few variables that we looked at there about relationships. And we asked them over 2,000 questions, various studies. There were groups, of, groups of, of, of measures. And what we found was a small cluster of, I can't remember if it was three or four questions. And the questions that, that predicted whether or not they had healthy, satisfying friendships and romantic relationships were around being seen and understood as a child. If they were seen and understood, the trauma that they experienced didn't seem to affect them. So back to the idea that you'll dent your children, that you'll hurt your children, you can't get away from that. But what you can do is develop a, a practice of seeing your child of understanding them, resonating with them. And you're going to make mistakes. You're going to be triggered. You're going to be upregulated. You're going to be anxious, angry, disappointed. The good news tonight, my favorite thing to realize is that your children don't need you to be perfect at this. They just need you to make your life the project, to work on yourself, and to stop making their life the project, fixing them. So even before I knew what I would be passionate about the rest of my life. I had this study in my back pocket that told me that, that, that we can overcome the, the dents and the bruises. We can, we can lessen the effect of the dents and the bruises by how we see our children. In the journey of the heroic parent, I say, how you feel about your child, not what you say. That's kind of a popular idea. I think a lot of people think that their inner voice, their critical inner voice sometimes, is their parent's voice. I don't think it's what the parents say. I think it's how the parents feel. Because most of us, the parents that show up to something like this, I don't think you're out there criticizing your children, yelling at your children all the time, trying to make them feel horrible about themselves. I just don't think that's true. That's not my experience of, of me and the people that I interact with. Um, but how you feel and think about them. Because a child, simply put, experiences worry in a parent as something's wrong with me. So what you might think, and sometimes we say, is love, you know, our worry and our anxiety for the child's well-being and safety. And our children, and I can say this for me as a child, I gave my mother plenty to worry about. It wasn't like she was fantasizing about my behaviors. I was abusing substances, I dropped out of high school, I got arrested. There was plenty of problems for her to be worried about. So what do you do with that? Your children are acting out, your children are self-harming, your children are anxious, maybe refusing school, maybe experimenting with substances. That's legit. I'm not saying don't feel worry. That's the thing people hear. It's so amazing, I think, with human beings that we turn every idea into a should. David Hume, the philosopher, called it the is-ought problem. We can have some idea of what is, but we really don't know what ought to be. So again, I'm not saying to you um, that you can't feel anxious about your children. You can feel it. It's warranted. You just have to take that and go somewhere else with it. That's the trick. If your child's struggling, 
Maybe they have a learning difference. Maybe they have some social issues. One of my children's on the spectrum. My transgender child's on the spectrum. And that causes distress and confusion in me because it's hard for me to relate to somebody on the spectrum. Of course, naturally, it's a, it's a fundamentally different way of thinking and processing in the world. So I, I struggle with the connection at times. But I have to go to psychotherapy to work on that. So I take my anxiety, my frustration, my anger, my disappointment, and I go to my therapist and I give it to her. I hand it off. I love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh where he said that, that to love somebody is to provide a space for them where they can empty out their heart. To listen well enough that somebody can empty out their heart. So I go on Fridays at 11 a.m. and I empty out my heart. And by the way, if you listen to my session, you wouldn't have come tonight. <laughs> you wouldn't be here if you listened to my session because I don't sound very enlightened, right? I was telling a group this morning, um, a few weeks ago my wife was out of town dropping my son off at college and uh, I'm not home alone. I, I've traveled a bit, the pandemic, of course, I've done less of that, but um, I really love being home alone. I don't get to be in my own house. I turn up the music. I do lots of things that teenagers would do. Um, I don't make the bed ever. I leave dishes. I'll get to them eventually. Nobody's coming over. So I do my therapy session on Friday. She's gone. And I found myself, I didn't plan my session, I found myself in the session complaining about her for, for 45 minutes just venting about how frustrated and exhausting she is. You know, our, our parenting styles were clashing. This is our fourth child. Our oldest two are 29 and 28, and I thought we had covered this ground already. And man, is she compromised. Man, is she screwed up. And if she could just get fixed, my life would be better, right? I'm giving that, that I'm letting that out. And I found myself kind of getting loud. Not too loud, probably about this loud. And what I realized, and I said to Jamie, my therapist, I said, I've just noticed something. I think part of this energy is, I know she's not going to walk by my door. I do my therapy in my office. My therapist is 90 years old, so I don't see her in person again. She wants to maintain the distance to stay alive, and I don't want to kill her. Um, that would be horrible to kill your therapist. Um, so I said... I've realized that I haven't given myself permission to express this anger and frustration that I feel towards her. I have to keep it low. I have to, to, to monitor, to mitigate it a little bit. So I finished the session venting. I went out back to my, my porch that I love to sit on, looking over the backyard, and I thought after about 10 minutes, I miss her. I can't wait till she comes back. I could really use a hug from her right now. I didn't fall out of love with her. The marriage wasn't ending. I was just frustrated. And she couldn't have listened to that 45 minutes. I couldn't have listened to that 45 minutes if I heard her talking like that. Right? I wouldn't have been, it would have been too hard to hold, too triggering, too painful for me to hear. But I found somebody, somebody safe to vent to. And because my therapist is a master, she just listened and understood and validated my experience. She also sees my, my wife. She's, my wife has been going to Jamie for 24 years, me for 23. So she, she knows a little bit about my wife. And she was so, she expressed so much, she honored so much that I was willing to just vent and be uninsightful. Because I spend so much of my time, right, as a therapist, as a father, trying to do well, trying to hold space for people trying to be accountable for myself, and I got to vent. And the result of it wasn't distance. The result of it was a return of the affection and the connection that I had with my wife. So we take that anxiety, that anger, that disappointment, that frustration, and we take it elsewhere. If you hand it to the child, right? And I, I, I hear parents do this. If you hand the anxiety to the child, it does what I said a few minutes ago. It makes them feel like something is wrong for them. It makes them feel like they're responsible. I mean, think about how, again, I'm not teaching you something you don't already innately know. It, the message is you're responsible for my unhappiness, my disappointment, my anxiety. I mean, that's actually what we're telling them. You're doing this thing. It's causing me to be anxious. Therefore, the solution to the problem is you changing your behavior. In essence, we're saying to the child, take care of my feelings. I'm not going to. 
I'm not responsible. And we learn in Al-Anon that I'm responsible for my own serenity, but, but the dumping of, the handing over of the emotion to the child is teaching just the opposite. You're responsible for my feelings. And then we wonder why the child goes out in the world susceptible to peer pressure. We were the first ones doing it. We were communicating to them. It happened to me, and believe me, I teach this. It's in my, it's in my, it's, I know this information really well, and I still can fall into it today. Not years ago, it was worse years ago, but I can still fall into it today. I can still ask my children to take care of me. So we handle it somewhere else. That's at a therapist's office, at an Al-Anon meeting, at a Codependence Anonymous meeting, with a mentor or somebody who's farther along in the process. That's one of the reasons why we like to gather parents together in groups, hopefully with varying levels of experience on different parts of the path. So somebody who's a little bit farther along the path can say, I know what it feels like, I know what it's like. It is terrifying, it is miserable, and you're in the right place talking about it to the right person. because children can't bear the weight of your life. As Carl Jung said, the unlived life of a parent is too great of a burden for, for a child to bear. And when we communicate in this process of telling them how we feel all the time, one of the most insidious parts of what we tell them is that we tell them that our, lo that our anxiety and worry for them is our love. It's just because I love you, right? My, my, I, I'm so worried about you. And then we say, you know, when the other spouse, it could be the husband, the father, the mother, it doesn't matter, the other partner, we say, well, he just loves you. Yes, he's angry, but he just loves you. And so children are getting confused because they, they're confusing fear and anxiety and worry and anger with love. The opposite energies in the universe. Fear and love are kind of the opposite. In my, my mind, they're probably the two most opposite energies that a human being can experience. But we're teaching children that it's the same thing. There's a difference between handing it to you and making you responsible and saying, I was feeling fear. I was triggered. I was angry. It's my stuff. A couple weeks ago, my 14-year-old who's struggling, I was out at the gym doing my gym thing. My wife was at her gym. It was a Saturday morning. And my wife, before she went to the gym, walked into... To, she was wondering why the light of our 20-year-old who's at college, why the light in his bedroom and his bedroom bathroom was on. And she walked in there, and my daughter was doing something she shouldn't have been doing in the bathroom. And my wife left me the message. When I got out of my workout, I saw it there. And I was absolutely frustrated. She was already grounded for a positive test. You know, we're working through the challenges. And on a morning when... I thought things should be going well. She was in the bathroom vaping. And I had a reaction, and it lasted a day. I didn't blow up at her. I didn't even talk to her. I just kind of kept my own space, and she could feel it. I made it clear. I didn't want to. It was just there. And then I came to her the next day, and I said, I'm sorry. It was my stuff. And I'm sorry it got on you. Yes, of course, you can talk about it. We just don't hand it to them. Right? right? We don't say... I'm anxious with an implication or even a belief that it's then their idea to take care of that anxiety. Because then they'll walk out in the world believing, and I know you don't want this. They'll walk out in the world believing that what other people think about them is about them. That what other people feel is their responsibility. They'll struggle with boundaries, right? They'll be susceptible, more susceptible to an abusive relationship where somebody is angry and worried and anxious and critical of them. Or somebody else. I mean, that's our problem in marriage, right? Even though as enlightened as we want ourselves to be, like on my event with my therapist, we believe a little bit that if our spouse just shaped up just a little bit. <laughs> it doesn't matter what people come into therapy for. The message is, this clown over here needs some work. <laughs> we can't not think that way, right? So we, we take care of our anxiety. We, we can own it. You know, people ask me, I said this, I've said this a few times, it never, hardly ever goes well. But I'm going to say it again, because I'm a glutton for punishment. I often say to parents these days, I'm almost at the point where 
I don't want any parent to tell their children how they feel. Back to your question. I'm all, and I say, I said almost at the point. And what I mean by that is it's rare that a person tells a person how they feel without the implication that the other person needs to change to make them feel better. So if you can recognize that, that to say I'm angry, to say I was triggered, to say my stuff came up, to say I'm having a reaction, I'm anxious, I'm going to take care of myself over here, you don't have to own it, right? We can do that. That's okay. That's even helpful. So that's okay. But it's very, very rare that I hear parents do it without that lingering ask. For it. Would you just stop doing drugs? Would you stop cutting on yourself? Would you please go to school so I can sleep at night? The question is, if we're, taking, if we're doing our work, tell me if I'm getting it right, yeah. and we're taking our anger and our worry somewhere else, and we're reacting more positively in a more healthy, balanced, connected way, how will the child react, react to that, that in that moment? They'll feel unburdened. They'll feel, what, I, I say this to parents all the time. I'll tell you this story to answer the question. I had a father. I was running an intensive, a five-day intensive. This father was there in, in, in the um, context of having a child, a young adult daughter who's struggling with depression and substance use. In fact, I wrote about him in the second book, and I loved his story so much, I asked him, I said, do you mind if I tell the story exactly the way it happened? Normally, I change a lot of facts and details and genders and all sorts of things when I tell stories, so it's not about a real person, it's about an idea, but I said, if you're okay with this, can I tell this? He said, you're, you're welcome to tell it. So this story's in the audacity to be you. At our intensives, the first half of it is your own work about your own family of origin. I don't care what you've come there for. Because you're having a midlife crisis, because you're thinking about switching careers, because you're having problems with your parents, because you're having problems with your child, whatever it is, we look at family of origin with the idea that that's where the answers, the problems, the issues that you're carrying around are, and we go back there to heal and work and unravel those. And then the second half of it is you get to come with one question, one conversation, one relationship that you have with somebody in your life or something in your life right now. It could be about deciding on your career. You could be having a conversation with your self-medicating behavior like your alcohol. And in this case, it was a father having a discussion with his adult daughter who was suffering from depression and substance use. And... Um, he went last of the six people. In fact, he, was, he had told me up to this particular exercise, he thought the intensive, it was his second one, he thought the first one was mind-blowing, and the second one was, eh, like this. And he wrote down everything the night before, because he'd watch all of his peers go through their discussions, some of them with their children, some of them with spouses, other things, and he wanted to not forget it, he wanted to remember it, so he wrote it down. He wrote down a healthy response to her, what he thought was a healthy response. And he said to her, I'm worried about your marijuana use, your self-medicating behaviors. You're, you know, I, I love you, and your, your depression is concerning to me, but I love it. Was, it, was, it was okay. I think most people would have heard that or read that and thought, it's a fairly balanced father. As he was reading the letter, he stopped and he said, I, I don't think this is going to work. So I had him switch roles and play his daughter. She wasn't there, but to play the role of his daughter and to listen. And after he listened, he got back into the role of himself, and he said to his daughter, I love you. I'm here for you. I may have to take some space if you're using, but it's your life, and you'll figure it out. I switched him as we do in these psychodrama role plays, and I had him sit in his daughter's seat, and the person repeated back what he had just said, a healthy response where he's owning his feelings, owning his boundaries. And as he was listening to what he had just said in the role of his daughter to answer your question, he had the reaction, she had the reaction, he had the reaction in her role of the way that they respond. She said, that's such a relief because, and he said, playing her on top of my depression and anxiety, carrying the burden of your worry is too much to bear. And so it's a huge relief that you'll take care of yourself and that I don't have to get better so that you're okay. So the answer is they feel relieved. And when your children get older and aren't financially dependent upon you anymore, they'll want you around because you're easy to be around because you're not getting your stuff on them. A Buddhist 
teacher once told me, in order to grow up, you have to kill your parents. And, and I responded and said, in order to grow up, you have to kill everybody. Right? And what that means, of course, symbolically is, you have to let go of what other people think of you. How do you do that? I mean, the, the question I get asked, even in my own sessions with my own clients, they'll ask me, I understand what it means. I'm starting to hear after a while, after a year, they'll say, of listening to you and doing psychotherapy. I'm starting to hear what it looks like when somebody grows up and becomes an adult and takes care of their own life. When a parent differentiates, individuates, and becomes responsible for themselves instead of making the children, you know that adage of you're only as happy as your least happy child? That's insane. And it's posited in our cultures like it's an ideal. It doesn't feel like an ideal to the child when your entire life and happiness is dependent upon how they're doing. You can, you can hear that. You can, you can feel that in your bodies. If you're responsible for your mother and father's happiness, the people who, in most cases, love you clearly more than anybody else on the planet, and if you're responsible for their distress and they're upset, something's wrong with you. You're hurting the person who loves and sacrifices the most for you. Something's wrong with you. That's the burden. That's the disease. That really is. I can't overstate this enough. The Drama of the Gifted Child by Alice Miller, if you've heard me at all, you've heard me reference it. It's the most important book written, in my opinion, on children that's ever been written. And the drama of the gifted child isn't talking about bright, smart children, academically gifted, intellectually gifted children. The gifted child is the child who can sense what the parent needs and gives that to the parent at the cost of their authentic self. And that is the fundamental disease that I treat in therapy every day, no matter what the presenting symptom is. It's not all, I mean, I don't want to paint it with too broad of a brush, but it's learning that, that, that mom and dad are responsible for themselves and husband and wife are responsible for themselves and friends are responsible for themselves. These two things that we know are proven across cultures, across socioeconomic statuses, countries all over the world study this, and it's the same thing. We know that the number one contribution you can make to a child's well-being, and I've chosen those words carefully, the number one contribution, not cause, not absolute control and absolute guarantee of outcome, but the number one thing you can do to contribute to a child's well-being is a secure attachment. A secure attachment is a stable, and I'm not talking about being consistent all the time. You're going you're to struggle with that. I'm talking about you're, being, you're there. You're there for the child. You're in their life. A stable, welcoming, like what the child is bringing, especially their inner world of feelings, is of interest to you. A welcoming and um, a person who's secure in themselves who doesn't need the child to take care of them. A secure attachment means I can be there for you. My role, if you're my daughter, is to be there for you, not vice versa. I'll take care of myself. But in this relationship, my relationship with you is about being there for you. We know that secure attachment is the number one contribution. Every culture shows it. Here's where it starts to get interesting. interesting. The predictor of whether or not you're able to provide a secure attachment a strong sense of self, a clear, clarity of self, a welcoming, inviting, safe environment for the child is how much you've understood your own early life experiences, your own childhood. Alice Miller said on page one of the book I was talking to you about, we have only one enduring weapon in our fight against mental illness, and that is the discovery of the unique emotional history of our childhoods. And we don't go back to get stuck we don't go back and become a victim. We go back to move through it. If you have reluctance to the idea that going back into childhood doesn't make sense or is irrelevant, there's a good chance that that's the message from the parent, that that's their own defense that you're carrying around. Ch people often don't want to go back and look at childhood because they're still carrying around their parents' ego and defense. In, I was going to say in dysfunctional families, but really in a lot of families. When I say dysfunctional, I'm not talking about toxic, crazy families. I'm talking about dysfunctional in the way that I and you are dysfunctional, like the average dysfunction, right? 
in our kind of dysfunctional family, the primary rule is to protect the parent's ego. The parent has to be good. If you had a parent that had done enough work to work on their ego and their daughter or son were criticizing them, they'd be like, absolutely great. I know they need to do that. Just like my wife knows I need to talk about her for 45 minutes to my therapist. She's happy. She doesn't want to hear that chit. <laughs> she won't listen to that. Nobody would want to listen to that. She's like, that's why we pay this person over here is to listen to you. So if you've done your own work, I have people come up. It happened in the last week. Somebody, after sharing something about their parents, said, I feel like I'm picking on them and being too critical. And I said, my ear didn't hear that at all. You were just talking about how they hurt you. You were talking about their, their humanness. You were talking about things that I've done to my children and worse. I've done worse. But because we are like my mother, and we have been taught to feel bad about the mistakes in our humanity, right? That becomes a threat to us. We're, we're taught as children that we're supposed to be good. The worst message you could give to a child, to be good. Instead of being good, the message is to raise a self, to raise who they are. So that we know the first thing. We know it's about attachment, secure attachment. The second part of it that we know is that how much of you've done of your own work predicts whether you can provide a secure attachment. But here's where it's magic. The magic is the quality of your childhood has nothing to do with your ability. Meaning, you could have had a good childhood and if you haven't done your work, you can't do it. I have lots of people that would report a fairly average, typical, even positive childhood. But if they haven't done their work to look at it critically, right? If they haven't explored their, their small dents and their small bruises, they can't do it. They can't understand somebody who struggles. I remember Paul McCartney in a recent documentary that he did, a three-part documentary with Paul McCartney. I thought it was fascinating. He said, when I left home, the biggest shock to me was that everybody else didn't have a positive, healthy, supportive, nurturing family. That was a big shock to me, he said. And that makes sense, right? He, didn't, he had not seen anything. We all assume to some degree that our families are normal. They're not. There's no such thing. So you have to look at it critically. Back to the idea, not only does, does having a good childhood not predict whether you can provide a secure attachment, it's all about doing your work, but, but conversely, Having a bad childhood, bad childhood doesn't predict it either. It just predicts if you've un unraveled it, if you've looked at it. Like Jung says, if you want to understand somebody else's darkness, somebody else's mental illness, anxiety disorder, depression, self-medicating behavior, get to know your own. And you'll recognize this too, the more work that one does, the more that we grow, the more we explore our, our lives and, and dig down in the basement and see what's there, the more we realize we're like everybody else. We don't make these superficial distinctions that, that we make when we haven't done our work. Like, well, I don't drink, right? I don't self-medicate with food or sex or gambling. I'm not like them, like other, like the other person. Sure, my problems are, are, you know, problematic, but they're not like that person over there. So what's the conclusion? Do your work. And find somebody who can listen to you without judgment. When I get asked, as I said earlier, by my own clients, how do you do this? I say to them, you, you're doing it right now. You're talking to somebody who can see you. You're developing what we call an earned attachment. I didn't have a secure attachment growing up. My father wasn't around. My mother was overwhelmed with the process of parenting, self-medicating with alcohol, not aggressive or violent, just gone, locked in her room. I didn't grow up with a secure attachment. I didn't know, I didn't get out of childhood believing that I was worthwhile because the two people who were supposed to be fascinated by me wanted nothing to do with me. So I spent the next 20 years of, 25 years of my life 
trying to prove to everybody that I was worthwhile, that I was cool and smart and clever, right? That I had these wonderful gifts to give to people. And I hurt a lot of people in trying to prove that. Right? I chewed through people because it was my ego the entire time. As I've healed, and it's, a, it's an ongoing process, I expect to be doing that until my very last breath, I get to take the energy that I was using for the first half of my life and trying to prove to the world that I was worth loving, worth sticking around for like my parents didn't do. And I took that energy and now I use it to give gifts to the world. The gift of love and listening and, and, and seeing. I get to sit with people struggling at all levels of functioning and awareness. I, I want to explain to you what, what it looks like to hear somebody at this level. I had a client some time ago. I'd seen her for a handful of years, five years or so. And um, at one, she really worked hard. She, she, she did her work outside of therapy. She came to therapy and listened. She, she shared. And at one particular, I mean, she, she had these really compassionate but difficult conversations with her mother. She was an adult with her own two children. She had this very difficult but compassionate conversation with her mother and about how her mother was impacting her in some of the ways that I'm describing to you today. And she's sharing all this wisdom. She's had great discussions with her husband around some boundaries. And I was just like, this is amazing. Like, to get to watch this part of it is really, really, you know, it's joyful to get to watch this. And then she concluded with some stupid thing, some uninsightful thing that sounded like the old her. And I was like, huh, she doesn't get it, I thought. So I come to my therapist. And I'm like, my therapist, I do supervision with her too. And I told the story, all this amazing growth. And then this one thing that kind of showed me that she was back at the beginning in a way. What do I do? And she said, well, here's what I would say to her. I would say to her, that's amazing. All those things you did. That tough conversation with your mother and your husband, good job. And then I figured it out. Right? Just notice it. Just hear it. She'll figure the other, the other thing out. That's the process. Carl, Carl Rogers said that it's only when we are accepted that we can change. That until I accept myself, I cannot change. Fred Rogers, Mr. Rogers, if you want to know what I'm talking about, what it looks like, watch the documentary that was done with him in 2000, I think it was 18, and the movie that was done by Tom Hanks around the same time. Carl Rogers was a master at this. He never tried to get a kid that was angry not to feel angry. He never tried to get a kid that was scared not to feel scared, or a kid that was sad not to feel sad. He understood what I'm teaching you tonight. He realized that if he just gave a kid a safe place to express and experience their anger and their sadness and their fear, they would heal themselves. Mental health symptoms are essentially our, our, our feelings and emotions coming out side, sideways symptomatically, right? And if we learn how to feel, and part of that as a parent is providing a safe place for them to feel, especially when the anger and the hurt is directed at us, it's really easy to hear them complain about some other bozo, but complaining about this bozo takes a little bit more capacity, right? And again, as much as I've been teaching this, just this summer, my 20-year-old said to me, one of my greatest wounds as a child, this is just a casual dinner conversation at the Reedy House. He said to me, one of my greatest wounds from childhood is that you guys underestimated my autism diagnosis, and I didn't feel seen or heard. And I made a flippant joke about it. Like, yeah, and if we had, if we had seen and, and, and heard it and, and given a lot of credence to it, then you would be mad at us for that. And I tried to make a joke out of it. And he just looked at me seriously. He said, I'm not kidding. And it's not okay that you're defensive right now. I couldn't say anything to that. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized this is three months ago, two months ago. And I realized as recently as that, I'm not listening to him. I'm not letting him be angry. And that's what he needs to do to grow up and to heal. So how do you do it? You find somebody that can listen to you. Your, your stupidness, your anger. My daughter told me that the shift in therapy, when she wanted to have a therapist, my daughter's a, she's 28, my older daughter, and she's finishing her PhD, PhD in clinical psychology. And I said, 
Jamie, our therapist, will take you on. Jamie's a very unique therapist that will see several people in the same family. And she saw Jamie for a handful of times. She's like, huh, nothing that you couldn't say to me. I already kind of get it. My daughter's a really good psychotherapist. And I was like, wow, that's a surprise. I thought everybody would love Jamie. Fast forward, she has a really bad fight with my wife. Really painful fight for both of them. So my daughter goes to therapy. My wife is the target of tonight's talk, isn't she? She goes to Jamie and she says, I'm not going to be rational. I'm not going to understand the other side or try to see it from her perspective. I can do that. I've spent my whole life doing that. I've been trained to do that. I'm just going to tell you what an absolute jerk she was to me. And she just vented. And she said, that's when psychotherapy changed. And then Jamie all of a sudden became a great therapist. What did Jamie say when my daughter was complaining about her mother? Good job. Thanks for telling me. But we're so anxious to fix them and shape them up into the way that we need to be. Just the other night, my 14-year-old, we were sitting at the dinner table, and I can't remember what it was, but she was saying something so stupid. <laughs> Luckily, my kids never listen to this stuff. <laughs> and I remember the experience of the energy just draining out of me as I didn't say anything back. It was something about friends or clothes or something. And I just sat there and I thought, this takes a lot of energy. Listening is harder than talking and teaching and lecturing. Listening requires more capacity. And in the pop psychology world today, all the good press gets, all the good press is, is directed toward being vulnerable. You know, Brene Brown, be vulnerable, tell the truth. And while that's a really important part of the equation and can't be ignored, I think by far it's the easier of the two processes in listening. I very rarely meet somebody who is skilled at deep listening. And at the end of a therapy day, at the end of an intensive, I have four therapists in my family, myself, my wife, my daughter, and her boyfriend. There are two best friends are over all the time. So there's often four therapists in the, in the house. And, and one of us will come after a long day of psychotherapy with just energy, angst, right? Because we've been listening all day. And that takes a lot. The master therapist is proud of themselves for what they don't say. Right? When I'm listening to somebody, I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for them to hear it. I'll reflect it back. I might give them an idea or a tool or a skill. That happens too. But really, I'm letting them process it out because I don't want them to think that this is another situation where they have to do it right. They already had a family of origin for that. And they don't need more of that, getting it right. When Emma decided to switch her conversation with the therapist and stop being a good, insightful, wise client, therapy became valuable to her. And then psychotherapy becomes the childhood you never had. And the therapist becomes, becomes the parent that you never had. And you don't have to take that personal. My four children all go to psychotherapy. And I hope that they're talking about how I screwed them up. I hope they're unraveling the wounds that I gave them. I didn't do it on purpose. I just did it because I was human. I have two older children, 28 and 29, two younger children, 20 and 14. And after the first two, I'm like, okay, I'm resetting. I got a whole new plan, a whole new game plan. I know what I did wrong with these two. I'm going to do it differently with these two. And I did. And I created a whole new set of problems. <laughs> and I have this belief that I was going to do it again. I'm not going to do it again. But if I was going to do it again, I would find a new way to screw them up, right? Because that's life. You're always growing. You're always imperfect. So tonight's talk is about just being human. And when you're human, your kids can be human. When you can be wrong and admit fault, your kids can be wrong and admit fault. People, one of the main complaints that parents will make about children is I just want them to be accountable. Well, why don't you start being accountable? Get on a regular basis apologizing when you make a mistake, if that's your your struggle. Hey, I think I dent you in this way. 
I think I took my anger out on you yesterday or last night or this morning or, or five minutes ago. I think I was asking you to take care of my worry. Sometimes they'll just say, oh, I'm just tired of hearing your psychobabble. That's okay too. It's not the words. It's an energy. It's a way of being with somebody. And psychotherapy, I believe that, that the outcome is a, is a transformation that's fundamental. And it's the hardest transformation of all because it's, it's the transformation of becoming who you are. And we weren't raised to be who we are in most cases. We were raised to be good, successful, contributors to society in a positive way. And thank heavens that some people haven't followed that directive from their parents or we wouldn't have Picasso or the Beatles. Right? We wouldn't have people that broke the mold and said, I'm going to do something, I'm going to break the rules, I'm going to not follow the rules, I'm going to be something different in the process. So back to the thesis of tonight. Healthy attachment predicated on how much work that you do. Virtually no exceptions to that. I don't, I've never met somebody who can deeply sit with somebody in their unsolvable problem who hasn't confronted and dealt with their own unsolvable problem. You know, I lost my closest friend a week ago. You can't solve that. There's no look on the bright side in, in my paradigm of life. It's just a loss. I will just miss him. And I need people that I can tell that to who will just listen to it and not give me some speech about he's in a better place or he's he experienced a lot of pain for a lot of years and he's that's gone now. I'm, I'm great. I'm glad he's not in pain. But there's a hole in my life that he used to occupy and he's gone. And I just need somebody to sit with me. And that's really hard to do. You know, I think the hardest sound in the world is the I was going to say the sound of a baby crying. I think that's close. The hardest sound of the, in the world is the sound of your baby crying. Right? We're wired that way. That's part of our DNA. Our child is in distress. We're to comfort them. So to sit with a child, my daughter finally found a therapist that she likes just this last go around. This is about her fifth therapist that she's tried. And I, I, I take that as a compliment to our family that she couldn't find a good therapist, frankly. And um, she said to us, this is the night before the dumb thing, she said, um, I really like Danielle. And all four of us therapists were there and we're like trying to underreact, right? We're like, good, that's great. <laughs> what's, she, what's that about? It's actually a referral from my daughter who, somebody she went to school with. And Liv said, I don't know, I just rant to her, or I don't know what word she used, I just complain to her and tell her what's up. And she just phrases it back to me, restates it back to me in a sentence or two, and I feel like she hears me and understands me and gets me. And I wanted to say, well, I do that. I mean, <laughs> I didn't. And my daughter said, my older daughter said to my younger daughter, that's fantastic. I'm so glad you found her. So that's how you do the work. You find somebody who can see all of you, not the pretty, smart, talented, generous, creative parts. Those parts are easy to see. And you all have those parts. It's finding somebody who can see your horrible, rotten self and be okay with it. And when that part of you gets seen, you're okay. When somebody sees that, my therapist said it this way, and this is after, this is after having a PhD, this is after 15 years in practice, this is after starting the most successful wilderness therapy program in the United States, four branches, So I was, you would think I would have figured this out. I'm in therapy, this is around 2011, 12. And I'm stumbling in a session to, to confess something. Therapy is kind of like confession. The difficult part in psychotherapy and the kind of psychotherapy I do and the kind of psychotherapy I participate in as a client, the hard part isn't listening to hard things, the hard part is saying hard things. So I'm confessing some buffoonery of mine can't even remember what it was. It all blends together. And uh, as I'm stumbling in shame to admit this issue, my therapist says, I don't think you understand what's going on here, Brad. She said, if you came in here telling me that you were having sex with a chicken, I would assume you had a good reason, and I would just want to understand why. <laughs> she didn't say sex. 
She said the F word, but I, it's on tape. <laughs> Got my attention. And I realized in that moment, I've never been in a room like this in my life. I know my wife wouldn't react to chicken sex that way. <laughs> I know my mother wouldn't react to chicken sex that way, right? But this person sitting across me just wants to understand. And then I understood in a deeper way than I ever had before what psychotherapy was. I can tell my story to a non-judgmental, non-anxious person, a person not trying to fix me, who can just see me and understand me, and I will fix and heal myself in that process. I'll be able to unravel it myself. The chicken sex will just go away naturally. <laughs> Thich Nhat Hanh said the same thing about alcohol. The Buddhist monk, the teacher, very prolific writer and teacher, died about a year and a half ago, I think. He said, I don't teach people to stop drinking. I teach them mindfulness. And, and alcohol is the opposite of mindfulness. It's an attempt to not be present in your life, right? He says, and when you learn mindfulness, you stop drinking. When you have a practice of mindfulness, drinking becomes distasteful for you. Mindfulness is a great idea. It's the practice of being with yourself, which is what I'm talking about tonight. But I want to be clear. If you've thought this or said this, I understand it. I thought it, and I said it when I was younger also. The idea that self-esteem is an inside job is not true. It is not true and never has been. That's not the way that human beings develop. Human beings don't develop in a vacuum. In fact, in Nazi Germany, we found out what happens when they develop in a vacuum, when they put all these babies in all these rooms without caregivers and human contact. Loads of them were dying, especially those that were farther away from the hallway because they had less contact with human beings and they developed failure to thrive. They just gave up life. You need human connection or you don't make it. And the deeper your human connection, the more okayness you feel. And you carry around a copy of yourself. Today, I carry around a copy of Jamie Gill. When I'm struggled or threatened, if I, can, if I can, and sometimes I can, sometimes I just react like everybody does. But in the moments I can pause and tune in, I think of the chicken sex story and I think, I'm okay. I'm okay. And then I can respond from a place of capacity to the people that I love and the people that I'm serving professionally. So you find somebody who can listen. You find somebody who can hear your story. And you just spend as much time for as long as you can around them. I've been in therapy with Jamie Gill for 23 years, I've probably about 10 years off and on with various therapists before that. Forced to go when I was eight years old because I was a problem early. Um, and I'm still going to go. And I don't go because I'm in crisis. I mean, the 14-year-old is, I say I don't go in crisis, it's, it's brewing. It's bubbling. But I was going before that and I'll go after that. I don't go because I'm trying to figure out her. I go that I'm trying, you know, that's my one hour a week where I can't get it wrong. That same client I told you that had all the wisdom and then the one thing that was not so wise, English is her second language. You can barely tell. She speaks with a, with a very, very subtle accent. And she was talking about in social situations, especially of a professional nature, she gets anxious. And although she can speak very well, she loses vocabulary, niche vocabulary of specific things in business, right? She just doesn't have the vocabulary sometimes. And then she, when she gets anxious and starts to stumble over vocabulary, she starts to, she says, just kind of rant incoherently. And she's describing this anxious experience that all of us can imagine and relate to, right? And I said to her, do you ever feel that way in therapy with me? Because I didn't sense it from her. And just as a matter of in passing, she said, oh no, I don't feel that way in here because I can't get it wrong here. I can't get it wrong here. And I thought, that's the goal, right? It's a great paradox that acceptance facilitates change. Carl Rogers said, when we are seen, our eyes fill with tears, and we have the experience of, oh, there I am. And we thank God for, for that. So that's the work, to expand your capacity, to embrace paradox. 
So many people are attracted to dogma and certainty in this world because it's supposed to reduce anxiety, right? The work of growing up and becoming an adult is to embrace paradox and uncertainty and mystery. To not know. Nobody has this shit figured out. And those who do have it figured out know that they don't have it figured out. You, you remain a student until your last day. And you're always learning. And I've said this this week a couple of times because it came up with my, my, my staff that, that worked for me. I said, when you realize that the child is your teacher come here to teach you and you are the student, everything changes. You're not the teacher. They are. And they're here to, just what they do, just to promote your expansion, getting larger. I want to go back to something. It's very important. I kind of skip over it and take it for granted. I've said it a few times, but I, I want to emphasize it a little bit. I'll tell you the story that, that highlighted it for me. I was in New York running a parent group one night before the pandemic, and I was teaching about expansion and listening to children and you know, holding compassionate space for people and things I'm talking to you about tonight. And two of the mothers in the group, it was about 40 people, at the exact same moment, using similar words, said, so I'm just supposed to be a doormat? And I thought, that's a really, that's a big miss on my part. This is not being a doormat. You have to be a self. Anxious parenting is not loving a child too much. It's not enough self. Codependency, if you know what that is, the, the kind of blending of identities with your children or with somebody else, feeling responsible for how they feel and vice versa, that's not too much love. There's no such thing as too much love. That's like saying you're too healthy. You'll never go to the doctor and says everything looks really too good. I think we have a problem here. There's no such thing as too good. So you, you've, you've, you're not a doormat. You're not without self. You're, you're a self. And let me illustrate it with this idea. I'll use the Dalai Lama because he's a public figure we all know about. The Dalai Lama is full of love, right? He's full of peace and kindness and non-judgment and empathy. And he goes out and gives talks and writes things about it. It's amazing. Let me be clear about it. He does more self-care than probably all of us combined. He's more selfish about his self-care, uncompromising about his self-care, than at least five of us. At least, he, he's ten times more better at self-care than I am. I was doing a, 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 a meeting with a monk a couple of years, several years ago, five, six years ago. They had hired me and a monk to come do a parent weekend for a treatment program in the States in Maine. I didn't know the monk. They just, we just showed up and the schedule was split up with him taking some time and me taking some time. It was the second day. It was after lunch, let's say 1.30. And I'm sitting there and it's 1.35 and I look at the owner of the program who's up on stage with me and I said, where's the monk? And he says, you see him back there in that room back there through that glass window? Yeah, I can see his orange thing that he's wearing. He's back there. And I said, what's he doing? He said, he's meditating. And I said, is he going to come out? And he's like, I guess when he's ready. About 20 minutes later, after the meeting was supposed to start, he walked in the room. I wouldn't have done that. I would have been on time. I would have thought it was disrespectful to make the group wait. I, I, I wanted to say, well, he had the schedule. Can't he schedule his meditation on the breaks? <laughs> I scheduled my self-care on the breaks. I didn't do self-care on the breaks. That's the hard part of the love and the compassion. That's the hard part of having the compassion and the patience. It's not the showing up moment, right? If you play golf, they say that the, all the bets are won and lost on the first tee when you handicap people. If I give you 10 strokes and I'm only eight strokes better than you, you win, right? My son said to me a few years ago when I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and we know that multiple sclerosis and stress are, are inextricably connected, right? My body is turning on itself. My immune system is attacking my nerves. They think that the, out, the outside coating of my nerves is a disease and they're eating away at it. And my nerves are then inf and getting inflamed and scarring. And that's coming, they think, the, the, the best that they can guess. It's coming in part because of the amount of stress that I carry. 
the lack of self-care that I do. And my son said to me, right after I was diagnosed, my oldest, he's 29 now, he said, Dad, you've got to rig the game to win. You're losing the game, not because the game is set up for you to lose, but because the way you're playing, it's not working. You've got to change some things. You've got to learn to say no to people. You've got to learn to let people down. You've got to learn to disappoint people. That's what enlightenment is, by the way. The monk in the back, he was letting us all down. That's the hard work. When you get into recovery for codependence and you start to grow and expand, you do this weird thing where you start to tell the people the truth about your boundaries. You don't say, well, my kid's sick, or I've got a headache. You say, I need to stay home tonight. Sorry to cancel. You tell the truth because you've made peace with your horrible, rotten self. You're not at war with who you are. You're not thinking that what you feel and what you need is a burden or a problem for somebody else and that you need to deny it to take care of them. And guess where we learned that? And it wasn't their fault. Their parents did it to them. And it wasn't our grandparents' fault because their parents did it to them. It's just what happens. My mother was overwhelmed. Her inability to parent was because of her, the damage that she experienced as a child, which I heard a lot about, as a matter of fact. And instead of owning that inadequacy and that, that, that limitation and making that her project, she did with what a lot of us do, and she made the kid the project. She made the kid the problem. I was the identified patient. I carried her wounds. She told me, you're an SOB. I thought that was the worst insult a mother could ever give to a son, by the way. <laughs> you know? She called me a little shit when I was a kid. I remember being at the grocery store when I was, I had to be, had to be before, um, well, it was probably about third or fourth grade. And I remember her saying to the cashier in front of me, I should be able to park in the handicap stall because I have him. Sounds really bad. It is really bad. She thought she was making small talk. But I knew it wasn't that joke. If we had had a close, connected relationship where she was there for me, that joke might have just been a joke. Maybe. But that's how she lived. She thought I was the problem. I want to give you the news tonight. Your unhappiness is because of the way that you're living your life. It's not your child. And I have children that I love. And I know when my children hurt, I feel empathic pain from that. I know that. And it's my job to go out and take care of myself. If you have a child that's struggling with mental health or addiction, you need more than the average parent. Some children require more. My, ass, my, my um, autism spectrum kid, I couldn't parent him the way that I parented my second born who was a people pleaser, right? The people pleaser was easy. It's going to be hard a little bit later for her. She knows that. She'll say that to you. She'll say, I made adolescence easy, but it's, you know, the, the problem is yet to come. So they're different, right? You have to, if you have a child that's struggling, I don't really care about, you know, I, I'll use a dramatic ex story to, to, to support the idea you shared. A few years ago, my publisher came to me and said, I want you to work with this father whose son is a mass shooter killed a bunch of people in Santa Barbara. You might remember the story, California. Shot a bunch of girls because he was frustrated they didn't want to have sex with him. Went out and shot a bunch of them. Shot himself at the end. So he was dead. And the dad was writing a book. And the, my publisher said, the dad, you need to help him with this book. And so I read the manuscript. I don't know if I've ever told this. I haven't told the story very, I don't usually tell the story um, but it's, it's a good one for this, this principle. When I read the manuscript the first time through, I had highlighted 93 examples of, of inadequate parenting, I'll call it, that he was positing as good parenting. One I remember, his son, who had a lot of anxiety. They had just bought him a new bike, and they were leaving this, the store, the Kmart or the Walmart or whatever it was, 
and he dropped the bike because he saw some friends from school and he was embarrassed and his dad got furious for him dropping the bike and told him to not care what those boys think. That was an example of dad's good parenting. And there were several stories like this. So I have to sit here with this father. We spent a couple of days. And I have to go over the mistakes that he made in the context of his son turning out to be a mass shooter. That was a hard couple of days. And I said to him, look, I've had a lot of parents who have parented more poorly than you have and their kids haven't killed anybody and never will. And there are parents that are better than you, whose kids do worse things than you. It's not about this direct cause and effect, but your son required something that you didn't know that he required, and I don't blame you. We, there was nothing you could have known, and I'm really, really sorry. Your children that are struggling need more. So if your attitude is, well, it worked for my other kids, or it worked for me, or I'm fine, they're asking you for something else. Our sensitive, struggling kids, and they are sensitive, our sensitive, struggling kids are saying, what works for others, what worked for my brothers and sisters, what may have worked for me when I'm younger, isn't working. You need to go get something that we don't have. You need to break a cycle that you haven't needed to break yet. You need to unlearn something you haven't unlearned yet or learn something that you haven't learned yet. So you're absolutely right. There's no generic technique or, 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 or to parenting. And I have dented my children in different ways and I've also supported them in different ways. And they require very different. One of the things I'm most proud of because of my parenting is how different my four children are from each other. I love that. That reminds me that at some points I have been able to support them in different ways in some ways. But you're right. That's absolutely true. It's not just this generic template. You know, fixing codependency doesn't cure the child's problems. Fixing your attachment wound doesn't fix the child's problems. Parent education doesn't fix children. You're not here tonight, no matter what you came for, you're not here tonight to learn how to fix your children. I mean, you are because that was the title of the talk and that's why you came. But it's a bait and switch, right? You're here to fix you. And my hope is that you feel some compassion from somebody who's struggling with the same things that you are, who will continue to struggle, struggle who's spent their adult life and even childhood life. I really spent my childhood life studying this stuff. I did not want to become a therapist. I hate a therapist. I was forced to go to them. Couldn't, my friend, when I was 19, said, you'd make a good therapist. I got so pissed at him. We had a good fight that day. And then I'm sitting in a child psychology course my first semester of college. After getting into college, I didn't deserve because I had dropped out of high school. But somebody saw my potential who cared about me and said, and had power at the university and just said, let him go in. For, you know, let him go in. No application. So I'm in my first child psychology course. And two, three weeks in, I'm like, I already know all of this stuff. I've been studying this stuff my whole life. And I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. This has my, been my work. This is my calling. And so somebody who's dedicated there, I think about this stuff all the time. It's, it's a curse, but I think about it all the time. And I still screw up a lot. A lot, a lot. And what sucks about being me is I'm aware of how much I screw up a lot. So I, then I have to deal with the guilt and the shame that comes along with it, right? When I had my firstborn 29 years ago, my attitude was, lucky you, Jake. Congratulations. I'm your dad. This is going to go swimmingly for you. I'm a therapist. I'm studying child psychology. You won the lottery of parents. That hurt him. Right? That really damaged him. Now, I screw up every day. All the time. And the, 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 the growth over those 29 years is partly because, not because I've become better, better. It's because I've, I've had some success with guilt and shame. You know, the subtitle of my second book, Learning to Love Your Horrible Rotten Self, that's a phrase my therapist would often use in therapy. She would say, she would use the phrase horrible rotten self. It's not really a horrible rotten self, it's just a human self. But we think it's horrible and rotten. 
Just like my mother in the story that I told you earlier, guilt is not the cure. Guilt, that's another thing that we were taught as children in our society gets taught still today. Even Brene Brown, in her second most famous TED Talk, given in Houston, Texas. She said, uh, she said, this is in the journey of the heroic parent at the beginning of one of the chapters on shame. She said, shame is associated with mental illness and addiction, she said clearly. And guilt is associated with mental health. Nobody in recovery from codependency believes that. Guilt gets in the way of you doing the right thing every day. To do the right thing, to tell somebody the truth, and I'm not talking about being cruel. If you and I are friends and I have to break plans with you or, or I don't want to go out and I have to say no or I can't help you and I have to say no to take care of myself, I have to wait back in the room, right? I have to overcome some guilt. I have to tolerate guilt, you see. So guilt in this case is telling me to do the wrong thing. So, so, so my progress, whatever it is, whatever, whatever that measure is of my progress, has been around guilt and shame. Guilt and shame is what I'm working on in therapy. What I'm working to get rid of. I also learned that you don't, as a person, you, your therapist can't take it away. I remember 2013-ish. I had something in therapy that I told my therapist, something about my wife that was bothering me or a feeling that I had or something that needed to be said, I felt needed to be said. And I go to therapy and I tell her and she's like, that's great, that seems normal, that's healthy. That's a fine feeling to have. That's a fine request to make. And after an hour I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. This isn't crazy, I'm not a jerk. I'm just Brad, I'm, I can say this. And I leave the session with a hop in my step. And I get in my car, and it's about a 20-minute drive from my therapist's office to home. And by the time I get to the off-ramp to my house, 10 minutes later, I'm like, there's no way I'm telling her what I just talked about. <laughs> there's no way, I thought. And it came to me. You're going to have to do it scared. You're going to have to do it guilty. You're going to have to do the right thing and feel the guilt anyway. And what you have now, because you have had a lot of psychotherapy, is you can carry that copy of Jamie around inside of you, that, that new programming that you're not bad because she's going to be upset or hurt or scared, right? You've been trained to believe that when you hurt mom, you're bad. And mom reinforced that. Not blaming or picking on mom. I've done that to my kids too. But I had enough overwriting of the old programming to be able to say what I needed to say when I got home. And I went home and I'm shaking and I love my wife and I'm scared and I'm thinking she's gonna freak out and lash out at me, and I tell her my thing, and she's like, glad you told me. Worked out okay. Could have gone badly, though. So we go to a place to be reminded that we're okay. And then I tell this hard thing to my wife that I have been convinced by my programming is wrong and bad because she's going to be hurt and upset. And I have to do it scared. So when you think about your project, as I said earlier, your children don't need you to be perfect. If they do, they're screwed. They don't need you to be perfect, and if they do, they're, if they do need you to be perfect, you're do they're doomed. They just need you to stop making them the project and to make you the project. And that's such a burden lifted. Like that man that I described to you at the intensive, when he said to his daughter, I'll take care of myself. I know you're struggling. I'll be there for you if you need me, but I'll be over here. When he played and sat in her seat, he could feel the burden. And he said it out loud. On top of my anxiety and depression, Dad, carrying around your happiness was just too much to bear. So I was trying to create distance from you, and I didn't know how, because again, I was afraid you were going to feel hurt and abandoned. Do you hear it over and over again? So you've got to find your life. You've got to be responsible for your life. We all do. I will admit, culturally, I think in the United States and Canada, I think it's still easier for men in most cases to do this. Just because of the way that our culture treats men and women, expectations. Women are the, you know, we, we all know this, women that work are expected to still be full-time mothers. And, you know, we come home and we're like, I'm going to watch a game tonight. You know, we, we're, we're a little bit more okay. We're not measured 
by how our children are doing, whereas women and mothers are often. I know that that's true, so I know I have a, an advantage, but I'm a very feminine man. And I have a lot of that guilt and that shame too, but, I, but culturally I know I have, a, I, have, I have just a tiny advantage, right? I got a corked bat if, they, if I was in baseball. But you have to live your life. It can't be on your children. It can't be that you're happy and this is, it can't be that, that you're only happy, as happy as your least, chi- as your least happy child, right? can't be that. First off, boundaries aren't about changing their behavior. Boundaries are about taking care of myself. That's the first principle. So I grounded my daughter because I don't feel comfortable with her using and she showed a positive on a test. So I did it to ironically, paradoxically take care of myself. As a father, I won't let my little child play with a knife. I'm not comfortable with that. So the way I talk to my daughter is she said to me, a week ago, she said, Dad, I really want to use recreationally. You know, just, just a little bit here and there. I just want to smoke pot a little bit. My friends, some of my friends are allowed to. And I didn't have a right answer. I just said, I'm just not comfortable with that. Just last week, I was at a wedding. My fifth child, my ex-wife's daughter. And they were raised in such a way that they call each other siblings. We were close. We were at her wedding in South, Car- South Carolina. And um, we were waiting for them to come out. It was a very small wedding, just immediate family and whatever role I would be called in that situation. (laughs) My wife, too. And um, somebody said, do you want sunglasses? We were outside, and I'm like, I'm good. And they're like, they're just inside. I can grab them for you. I'm like, no, I'm good. And my my 29-year-old says says over the shoulder of the person asking me, he knows himself. (laughs) Boundaries are about self. This is what I'm comfortable with. The Al-Anon recovery person learns that. They learn to say, this is what I can do and this is what I can't do. Now, the reason, they, they struggle, the reason we struggle with that is because of the shame and the guilt of letting somebody down and somebody being upset, right? So that's what I've been talking about a lot tonight. So boundaries don't change our children, but when we have boundaries, our children change. They have to learn the limitations. It's not, I thought for a long time that my goal was to be so big have so much capacity, have so few needs, right, that my children would flourish in that context. They need an edge. But the difference is, I will own the edge. This is my limitation. This is what I'm comfortable with. This is the line I draw for myself, right? I say to my, if I had an alcoholic spouse, I don't say, you need to stop drinking. This is what a boundary sounds like. This is the best way to answer this question and how it relates to being a self. You say to your alcoholic spouse, it's actually none of your business whether they drink or not in the long, in the big picture. You say to your alcoholic spouse, you can keep drinking. In fact, I've spent the first 15 years of our lives trying to get you to stop and I give up on that project, but I can't be here if you drink. So you see the difference? It's just a boundary about, boundaries are about taking care of you, not changing another person. Somebody asked me years ago, I wrote this in one of the books. They said, how good are you with boundaries, with clients? And I said, I was pausing, thinking, good sometimes, not good other times. And then she clarified, thinking I didn't understand. And she said, if a client called you on a Sunday in a non-emergency emergency situation, would you be sure not to answer the phone call or respond to the message to show them your boundary? And I said, oh, I don't set boundaries to change the client. I set boundaries to take care of myself. So the whole shift is about boundaries and self is about being a self about being a person, about honoring this need, but I've got to sit with somebody who honors it with me, right? Who tolerates my horrible, rotten self, who would say, if you need to sit in that back room, and if they don't want to hire you next time, they, can, they cannot hire you, but you can do what you need to do for you. When he was sitting in the back room to develop the capacity that he had later in his talk around compassion, he was being selfish, but he knew what he needed. I said to my son when he said the things about the sunglasses, I said, I'm going to use that. He knows himself. So the boundary is about, and I, I do practice this. I'm practicing it. I try to show my wife. I say, it's okay to say no. It's okay to not be everything. It's okay. I know your guilt as a mother because the family you grew up tells you you're supposed to give everything away, that you're supposed to be a doormat, but you're allowed to be selfish. You're allowed to take care of yourself. And they can get mad. The cool thing when you start taking care of yourself, what I found, is that the people around you 
change, that you lose some. And then you get some new ones. And the new people are like, when you cancel last minute, they're like, I'm glad you're taking care of yourself. The old friends are like, come on, we've made the plans, come on, do it. It's just you're not negotiating anymore. So boundaries are about self. Boundaries are the line. I love my favorite quote about boundaries. Our boundary is the distance between you and I, which I can love you and me simultaneously. And a lot of times my anger and resentment is because I'm expecting you, my son, my friend, my partner, to take care of me, and I'm resentful. But that's usually a signal that I'm not taking good care of myself. I'm not setting a boundary. So again, same thing. You've got to work on the guilt and the shame that tells you what you should be, what you should do. You know, midlife crisis, if you've gone through one or seen somebody gone through one, you might even have a parent who went through one. It's messy and crazy. You know, people get selfish. They seemingly divorce their spouses out of the blue, and it looks crazy because it is. Because they're trying to find themselves. They're acting like a child because they skipped that part. Because they've lived somebody else's life for 40 years. Right? So the job is about being a self, and boundaries come out of that. I don't think about boundaries. I don't think about my boundaries with you about teaching you something. I think of my boundaries about what I need. And I'm not saying I'm good. I, I don't, I'm not saying I'm good at it. But that's the thought. And when, I, when I'm not good at boundaries, when I struggle with being a self, I'm supposed, I've been advertising this intensive that I have to go to for a, a year that I'm going to be running it in mid-October, and my friend who passed away, they just set his funeral on the day that I'm supposed to be doing this event. And I was talking to my colleague over here at dinner. I'm like, I'm struggling with knowing what I need and knowing what I'm okay with. I said, I think Peter would be okay with me working. I think he knows that I loved him. And I know that he loved me, and I'm struggling with me. Like, what am I? I'm going to call my wife later and say, hey, I just want to hear your thoughts on it. I'm trying to find myself, and I don't know what my boundary is. Do I let down his sister, Kristen, who I also care about, and his parents? Do I take care of myself? Am I over-prioritizing work because I have this internalized capitalism that I'm struggling with? You know, I have to figure out who I am, and then my boundary will come out of that place. That's why I don't like teaching about what to do with boundaries, because it has to come from the authentic self, right? It has to come from you. Sometimes we learn from the outside in, but often it goes in the, in the inside out. The title of the book, The Journey of the Rogue Parent, is based on a man by the name of Joseph Campbell who studied world myth, historical myth, every myth from every culture that he could find. I, I think when he died, he was dealing with, a, he was trying to create a, a, um, a book that had virtually every myth he could find side by side that talked about various issues. There's never been a human on earth that has studied and knows myth more than Joseph Campbell. And what he developed was this idea that, that the myths are telling one basic story. He called that story the hero's journey. And that the, it's about the, the transformation into becoming your authentic self. I remember when I was a kid and I saw the movie Rocky. We were you know, probably 10, 12 years old when it came out. I remember having a fight on the playground with my friends about whether or not if Rocky won, because we, we, we didn't have the same idea about whether he won. You can't hear it at the end of the show, because he's yelling Adrian, and they're announcing Apollo Creed wins, and you're not really hearing it, right? And I'll tell you why that is. Because the heroic journey is you go after this thing, the Knights of the Round Table went after the Grail. And, and not insignificantly, they went after the grill and they thought it most honorable to go into the forest where there was no path, each of them, where there was no path. Because if there was a path, it was somebody else's path. So they went into the forest to look for the grail. And they did it for years and they never found it. But they came back with stories of adventure to tell. They came back with the story of their life. And parents who go through this process come back with that story. You come to these meetings, you come to these programs, you, you listen to parent books and parent podcasts and parent educators because you're searching for the grail, and the grail is a safe, healthy, happy child. Sometimes you find that, but often you don't. But what you come back is with a clear sense of yourself, with your own adventure, with your own life. And then you share that story with other people 
who are farther behind you. That's the hero's journey. And the reason why I believe that they didn't emphasize who won in the first show, Rocky, because they knew this. They knew that, that, that the gold wasn't that Rocky won or lost the fight. He lost, by the way, if you don't know. I was wrong, actually, on my childhood fight. I was the <laughs> but he won in a different way, right? He found love. He found himself. That's the hero's journey, and it's over and over. You watch Frozen, the child's cartoon, little girl with magic that screws everything up and gets punished because of her gifts. So she goes and hides away in an ice castle until the whole village kingdom is now in trouble, and then they go find her and bring her back, and she takes that gift back, and she saves the, the community. That's the heroic journey. You bring back your gift. So that's what this is about. It's about the fact that parent education is not about changing children, it's about changing parents. And that healthy parenting does not produce well-behaved children. It produces parents who have peace and serenity and clarity. That the outcome of healthy parenting is a better lived life. That's what it's about. And I conclude the book with this. In the epic story of Gilgamesh, perhaps one of the oldest surviving works of literature, speaks to every parent's journey. In the ancient Mesopotamian myth, Gilgamesh becomes distressed at the death of his friend Enkudu. Due to his suffering, Gilgamesh leaves his home and undertakes a long and perilous journey searching for the secret of eternal life. He endures many trials and tribulations on his quest. He swims to the bottom of the sea and retrieves the plan of immortality. When he resurfaces, he sets it down on the ground, and while he bathes, the serpent steals it, and the sacred plan of, plan of immortality is lost. Yet he travels home, and he has this story to tell. So what does the hero find? On his journey, he finds the elixir of healing wisdom, something he can share with others. We experience deep pain and develop compassion as we face the depths of our own struggles. And what we find is our story. We sit in groups, tell our stories, and listen to the stories of others. That's the message of this book. That's what I meant when I started off by saying, the question is not the question. It's our struggling children and our willingness to ask different questions that reveal our authentic selves. The hero brings back herself, a deeper, richer version of herself. Loving your child is something you cannot not do. You will break and bleed. Old things in you will die. And in their stead, new ones will grow. And what will you have at the end is your story. For me, even as a teacher, the elixir isn't always in the form of words. Some of what I have gleaned from my experience, from my journey, is difficult to put into words. That's because it's an experience, not an explanation. You learn something by going through it that you can't learn any other way. My education and my study have given me language, but being present on my painful and beautiful journey has carved out a place for more compassion toward myself and others. I'm honored to sit and offer some of the observations from the thousands of heroes' journeys that I've seen parents and children traverse. This is my story. This is my gift. This is also the gift that the remarkable, wonderful, struggling children and parents have given me, and I in turn give it back to you. Thank you for coming tonight.